They say their mission is to save the country from socialism. The Idaho Freedom Foundation, a think tank headquartered in Boise, has grown to be one of the most powerful forces in Idaho politics. I was on your side when I sat down with the organization's president, Wayne Hoffman, and no topic was off limits. So we are here with Wayne Hoffman, president of the Idaho Freedom Foundation. To begin things, for people who may not be familiar, how would you personally describe the Idaho Freedom Foundation? Well, we're what's described as a free market think tank. And um, our, 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 the, the, the best words I, I can take right from our mission statement, which is we're trying to save the country from socialism. And that means exposing it, defeating it, and replacing it with free market principles. Even here in Idaho, that's something that is important to do. I know in your mission statement, you say that you want Idaho to be a laboratory of liberty. What does that look like to you? Well, it means that every state in the country right now is, socialism, is socialist. Um, the states have taken it upon themselves, individually and collectively, to implement various facets of socialism, which means they've given up on free market solutions. They've given up on allowing communities and families and networks of friends and individuals and churches and community organizations to get together to help the people who are in need, who need certain things. What I want to see is the opposite. I want to see, and we used to do this, by the way. This used to be pure Americana. It used to be Idaho. Um, people who were ruggedly individual and they you know, worked hard for a living and they did whatever they needed to do to, to advance the needs of their families and their communities and their state. And so that means depending on one another and depending less on the government. You mentioned that you think that socialism is a part of every state in America. And this is a word that I feel like is often really weaponized, right, socialism. What aspects of the state governments or federal government do you think are socialist? Because sometimes I think people maybe have the definition of socialism confused. Sure. Well, the public education system is a great example. The public education system, we, we, it, it's a, a system wherein we take money from you, and then we use that money to create an education system, uh, elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, and then we put students in a one-size-fits-all system that's designed more for the benefit of the people who are running the system than it is for the, the kids that are part of it. Um, a, uh, the Medicaid system, any welfare program, those programs are also socialist. They take money from people who earned it and redistribute it to the system in order to supposedly help people. They don't necessarily help people, but they create the system, and then the people who benefit from that system seek to maintain it. Do you feel like there are any positive aspects of socialism in this way or no? No. There, there are absolutely none. Uh, socialism has the same negative impact whether they're doing it in the former Soviet Union or they're doing it in Cuba or in Venezuela, um, the same impacts, the same outcomes, uh, they're predictable. And we're seeing them play out here in the United States today. And every state is doing the exact same thing as these other countries that we look at and we feel sorry for. Uh, Venezuela, Cuba, uh, those countries used to be the, the envy of the world. They had, people used to want a vacation there because they were wonderful places to go. You wouldn't do that. No one talks about vacationing in, in Venezuela anymore, and for good reason, and it's very difficult to get into Cuba, and their economy is a shambles because of socialism. And on the flip side, though, I mean, you look to some countries like Norway, Sweden, places that people do speak very highly about. They're obviously very socialist nations. People view them that way as well. What's the difference? They, they, they are also states that have, I'm sorry, countries that have a, a lot of economic troubles uh, where people are still under the gun of government regimes, maybe not the way they are in uh, places like Venezuela and Cuba, but still it, it's, they don't get to, to realize their full potential as a result of government interference in their marketplace. The same thing can be said here, and, and that's the trouble, is that really there's one thing that is weighing upon society in the United States, in Idaho, and in other countries, and that's government interference. 
and it may not look the same, it may not play out the same everywhere, it may not play out to the degrees that it does in places like Venezuela and Cuba, but it's still playing out. And you see it here in the United States today. Uh, for example, uh, if I own property, I can't simply go and paint my house if I want to in a lot of jurisdictions. I have to go get permission from the government. If I want a job, you know, I, I can't necessarily just go and hang out a shingle. I've got to talk to eight different government agencies who then get to decide whether I get to have that job or not. So it plays out in, at different levels and in different ways, but it's still playing out and it's still harmful to people. We're going to go through a few topics and kind of take us through some of your views and Idaho Freedom Foundation's views here in Idaho. And we're going to begin with the legislature reconvening and the results of that. And I say this as we're sitting here in the Joint Finance Appropriations Committee room, so a little, a little bit ironic in that sense. But on Twitter, the Idaho Freedom Foundation was critical of the results from the tail end of this legislative session, saying, quote, this was, what a complete and total disaster. This is embarrassing. Why does the Idaho Freedom Foundation feel like the results of those final trio of days was embarrassing? Well, we were pushing for the legislature to reconvene for many months. We said that the legislature has a role to play in stopping not only federal vaccine mandates, but the imposition of vaccine mandates by state agencies on state employees and the general public. That was, that was the, the objective from the very beginning. And we felt that the legislature had a responsibility to protect people from these overarching mandates, whether they come from the federal government or they come from a state agency or from a, uh, a, a business that is basically implementing the federal mandate via the, the Biden rule. Uh, that, that was it. What the legislature did instead was they spent several days together and then all that money went to sending a strongly worded message in a joint memorial to the Biden administration, which is ultimately going to be ignored. Complete waste of money, complete waste of time. Uh, meanwhile, Florida, Florida's legislature convened, and they passed legislation to prohibit vaccine mandates, to prohibit COVID passports from being implemented. Idaho could have done that, and it didn't. It was an embarrassment. Idaho, of course, as you know, is part of the multi-state lawsuits for all three of the Biden vaccine mandates. Why do you feel like that's not enough? Well, it, it's basically a talking point so that... Uh, elected officials can go back to their constituents and say, look at me, I'm fighting Joe Biden. That's what the game has been for decades in Idaho. Whenever people question the credentials of an elected official, are you conservative enough? You go and you say, here's what I'm doing to battle uh, the, the, the Democrats in Washington, D.C. It, it's just political theater. So it doesn't do anything. And in fact, the existence proof of that is the fact that while the State Board of Education, which is controlled by Governor Little, the State Board of Education decided to sign on to an anti-Biden administration vaccine mandate lawsuit, and in the same motion also voted to implement the same mandate. So what's happening right now in Idaho is our colleges and universities are busy trying to put in place the Biden vaccine mandate. That's what's happening right now. So I look at actions more than words. Anyone can join onto a lawsuit. So what they've done is they've signed onto the lawsuit and secretly they're hoping that they lose so that they can go back and say, look, we did everything we could to, to fight Joe Biden and his vaccine mandates, but there's nothing we can do. The real power is what they've chosen not to do. They've chosen to not fight the vaccine mandate in our colleges and universities. And now students and employees are facing the threat of having to get vaccinated or either be kicked out of their jobs or kicked out of college. And, you know, kind of speaking a bit about this college angle, because it did mostly concern federal contractors, people, most of them often working on research grants. They were concerned about losing that money. Do you think that they should have just you know, gone with not implementing that mandate and risk losing you know, many, many millions of dollars. Definitely. It's all about money, right? I mean, I think um, businesses in Nazi Germany could have made the same argument. Well, we'll lose money if we don't go along with the Nazis. I, I don't think that's good enough. You have to protect. Government has a role, and the role government has to play is to protect the autonomy, the individual, 
to protect people from government tyranny. That's why the founding fathers set up the, this, this dual federalist system where you've got a federal government and you have state governments, and state governments stand in the way. They stand in the abyss, protecting people from federal tyranny. When they don't do that, that's exactly what you just described happens. They say, oh, well, you know, we don't want to lose the money. We're afraid of losing support. We're, you know, it's millions of dollars. We've got this research program that's really important to us. I get that. All those things are very important. What's more important is protecting people's freedom. That is the number one role of any government. When you do talk about potentially losing that money, though, you're also saying potentially Idaho's students in college could be losing out on valuable research opportunities. How would they get that back, or how would they get that experience back if that money was taken away? So they still have research apparatus there. They still have the technology to conduct research. The only difference is, is that they get these federal grants for very specific projects. Unfortunately, the thing that is more important is the preservation of liberty. Once you lose liberty, you just don't get it back. I see it happen all the time. The last policy decision becomes the springboard for the next policy. So when legislators or agencies sit back and say, oh, this time we're just going to allow it to happen because the amount of money is too important. That becomes the framework for the very next thing to be used against us. So then we go back and we say, oh, back in 2021, we said we we're going to continue taking the federal money because it was too important in fighting COVID-19. Then it becomes the framework for the next fight. So when they have COVID-25, they go and they say, oh, well, you remember back in 2021, uh, we said we weren't going to fight the federal government on their mandates because we didn't want to lose the money. And that's how things played out then. And this is how it should play out now. You either protect liberty today or you lose it. And there's no getting it back. And it's way more important than any federal grant. Getting back to the legislature reconvening, obviously we saw a number of bills make their way through the House, and then they ultimately died in, in Senate committee. Do you lay the blame equally on both chambers, or do you lay the blame more on members of the Senate? I lay it on Senate leadership and House leadership. Uh, the House Speaker Scott Bedke knew what he was getting into the moment the legislature convened. He knew it was going to happen, but he wanted to at least go on record as supporting conservative proposals to ban vaccine mandates and COVID passports, knowing that the bills would go over to the Senate and die. And there you can blame Senate pro tem Chuck Winder for that, because the Senate is extremely left of center. And they like to hide under the fig leaf of, oh, we're Republicans, we're fighting Joe Biden. Same rhetoric that everyone else is using, but it's obviously not true because they're allowing for this to take shape so that nothing happens. And for you, when it comes to the legislature reconvening these bills, ultimately not making its way through, what would the ideal session have looked like to you? Well, there are a lot of proposals out there that protected medical privacy. So basically, it were, there, there, there are two things. One is, we don't live in a fascist society where when you go around to Walmart or Albertsons or you get on a plane or you get in an Uber or you walk into this building, somebody is asking to see your papers because that's what happened many years ago, not very many years ago, really when you think about it in the great scheme of things, in Europe in the 20th century where people were told, I need to go see your papers before you can go somewhere. And so what we said was protect people's medical privacy uh, it doesn't matter whether you're an employer, an employee, it doesn't matter whether um, you're a customer of a, of a restaurant or a customer of an airline or you're going to see the Bronco game, whatever it may be, no one should be asking you to see your medical paperwork before you go into some building or some facility or some event. We already have that now. We've understood that for many years that people have a right to medical uh, privacy. Um, we say that with regard to abortions, we say it with regard to HIPAA, that people don't have a right to go look at your medical records before you go somewhere. That's all. So we were asking for the legislature to say, number one, that your medical privacy is protected. Don't, there's no such thing as a COVID passport operating here. And number two, that state agencies shouldn't be implementing COVID passports. We saw that start 
a couple of months ago when Boise State University said in order for you to go see a Bronco game, you had to have a, a proof that you've been vaccinated or that you have a negative COVID test. Don't do those things. Those are very, very simple propositions, and they failed to do that. When, when the option is given, though, to test, so you don't necessarily have to get the vaccine, what is your problem with that? Well, I mean, it's, the, it's, it, it's sort of like, um, you know, you can go to the, you can either demonstrate that you're uh, test negative or we can punch you in the face. Uh, a COVID test is very expensive. And so what it's done, it's designed to be cost prohibitive so that people just kind of surrender and they say, well, I guess we just, you know, it's going to cost me $50 every time I go get a COVID test to go to the game, to go to Walmart, to go to the restaurant, to get in an Uber. Um, I, I can't spend $200 a week on COVID tests, so I guess I'm just going to go get vaccinated. So that's the objection. What, whether people are negative or positive is none of the government's business. They're my medical records. I get to keep them. And in this case, the government is saying, nope, we need to know what your medical history is. We need to know whether you've been vaccinated. We need to know whether you've been tested. And, and that, that's it's simply not, not appropriate for anyone to be asking you. It's none of their business. So often the conversation is about personal choice, however. So if you're saying somebody might say, well, these tests are too expensive for me to do regularly, so I'm going to get the vaccine. Is that not a personal financial choice that somebody made for themselves? No, because they've been pushed into a corner. They've been given two options, neither one they want. There are perfectly valid reasons for not wanting a COVID test. I've had them. They are very unpleasant. And there are people who have had those tests and they haven't been done correctly and they end up with some kinds of injuries. Um, so they are invasive. And the, the question is, do people have the right to go about their business, engage in the economy without having to go through these obstacles that are put in place by government? And I think that the government is, in, is doing it's designed to be uh, difficult so that people finally just throw up their arms and say, OK, I give up. Sign me up for the, for the shots. So oh, now I have to go get a, a booster. Sign me up for that. Oh, I've got to get more boosters because there's another variant out. I guess I guess I'll go do that. They're designing it to be inconvenient so that people ultimately give in. So they're given a choice, but it's not much of a choice. For many jobs, I mean nationwide, you have to get like a TB test, right? Something that is not pleasant. You have to go back and you have to have it screened again. What's the difference between that and between you know, a COVID test being mandatory for a job? See, that's what I've been saying about the last policy becoming the vehicle for the next policy. Because I hear this all the time. It's like when, when we were fighting Obamacare uh, 11 years ago, what did everybody say to me? It was, well, Wayne, of course the government should be able to tell you to buy health insurance. After all, we make people buy auto insurance. So it's always easy to use the, the last policy for the next thing. Well, of course it makes sense that we could tell you to buy health insurance, because, to buy a gym membership because we make you buy health insurance, because we make you buy auto insurance. The last policy is always the vehicle for the next thing. So the reason I say that is because we go back and we say, but wait a minute, we make people do X, so doesn't it make sense that we make people do Y? What I'm saying is, by putting mandates in place, we slowly take away people's humanity. And in that humanity is the ability to make decisions, right decisions and wrong decisions. So now it's, well, we make you get a TB test. Oh, well, you know, if you want to go to certain countries, you get a test, a, a vaccine for yellow fever. I get it. But stop telling people to go do it and instead give them the option. Because if your solution is so wonderful, you shouldn't have to make people do it. I've always found that to be very strange that in order to, to compel people to go do something, they say it's so wonderful, but they've got to force you to do it. Well, what if you didn't use force? What if you just had a compelling argument? That would be a billion times better than what we've got right now, where we have a mandate top-down society where certain people make the decisions and everyone else is just told to, to obey. And if you disobey, then you're the bad guy. You talk about this in the sense of X and Y, but it seemed like with X, for the most part, you didn't hear all of this outcry. You know, people seem to be okay with it. What is it about now, about Y, that has people so upset? Because now you kind of see that there's no limit. 
right? Because there, no, one's, no one's been able to articulate what that limit looks like. And in fact, when we start talking about the limits on social media, I see people talking about rounding up folks who are unvaccinated or fining them for not wearing masks and jailing them for, for sending out messages that they disagree with on social media where they question the efficacy of vaccines or certain COVID protocols. That's what we're up against now is people are starting to go, wait a minute, where is this limit? Where do we stop? And they can't, they, the folks that are imposing this on it, on us, can't answer those questions or won't answer those questions. So we've sort of reached this pinnacle in society where the command and control people are being asked tough questions. Where does this end? And they can't give you an answer. We'll move a little bit into the political realm now. Many outlets will call Idaho Freedom Foundation a libertarian organization. I know on you guys' websites, you call yourselves nonpartisan. Can you maybe explain how you view yourselves as a nonpartisan organization? Well, first of all, um, people throw words around like that. I've seen folks refer to us as a libertarian organization with a capital L. That's flat out wrong because that refers to the Libertarian Party. We're not part of any political party. Libertarian, Republican, Democrat, Constitution, we are not part of any political party. Now, when it comes to ideology, the media loves to put us in some kind of a box. You're a libertarian organization. You're a conservative organization. Boxes don't work. Um, all we are is an organization that believes in liberty and free markets. We believe in hu humans being able to make choices for themselves. The closest thing, probably, if you want to try to box us in, is a conservative organization. Why? Because conservatism also includes that branch that includes libertarians. Does that make sense? In other words, here's conservatism. It's like this. Libertarians make up this part of that spectrum. We comprise all of that. We believe simply in limited government, low taxes, less regulation, getting government out of our lives so we can raise our families, live free and prosperously, so long as we're not interfering with others. Do you feel that Idaho Freedom Foundation is aligned with traditional conservative values or sort of a, a new wave of conservatism? I mean, we, we believe in, in a lot of the things that you find in the Republican Party platform, that, that people say that they support as Republicans, uh, uh, low taxes, less government, uh, uh, government not weighing down on people's private property rights. Um, many of the things that you find there, you, you will see in, in the work that, that we do. So I don't know if it's new. I mean, that the stuff that's been in the Republican Party platform has been around long before the Idaho Freedom Foundation was around. The only thing that we're doing is we're holding people accountable for their for their actions and not just their words, because everyone, everybody goes into campaigns, I support limited government, and then they pass a billion regulations. Uh, we don't. We don't sit there and go, oh, well, there's a Republican that's behind that, so it must be good. Uh, we look at, at legislation, we look at policies, and we see, does it grow government? Does it reduce the ability of the private sector to act independently of government? Does it, in, does it inflict harm on families? Does it make it to where it takes money from people who earned it and give it to people who didn't? Um, those are just things that, that policymakers have been talking about for decades. Only now they're being held accountable for it here in Idaho. There's been much conversation over the past year or two about the power that Idaho Freedom Foundation has wielded in the state of Idaho. Some even calling them the most powerful lobbying group in the entire state. Do you believe that's true? Well, we are, I mean, we're, we're, we're a think tank. We propose policy solutions and we hold people accountable for the things that they say and they, they, that they do. There's no real power in that. We just speak truth to power. So if, if we happen to be influential because we, we have a great reputation and because we've managed to change the dialogue a little bit here in the Capitol, good. I'm, I'm proud of that. I, I, I have no problem whatsoever saying that. Um, yes, we've become a very influential, maybe one of the most influential organizations in the state, but it's because we have credibility for the work that we do. One of the main goals of the Idaho Freedom Foundation is, of course, reducing federal government dependency. Uh, there's been significant talk about 
your organization accepting $130,000 in PPP loans. Do you believe that, well, one, did that happen? And two, do you believe that that is in direct conflict with the beliefs of your group? Oh, yeah, it happened. I mean, it's one of those things where they, this is the box that people put us in, right? Um, I owned a house. I, I think that the um, mortgage interest reduction is wrong, absolutely wrong. It's not right that a renter should pay a higher tax rate than a person who owns a house because they managed to get through the government a mortgage interest deduction. But I claim the mortgage interest deduction. Why? Even though I don't believe in it. Because I have to. That's the situation. That's the box that we're placed in. My kids attended a public school. Why did they attend a public school instead of a, a, a private school? Because those are the conditions that were laid upon me. To get here this morning to work, the, to do this interview, you had to drive on a, on a freeway that was paid for with public dollars. Do I believe there should be publicly funded freeways? No, I don't. But those are the conditions under which we're forced to operate. So when the government shuts down all of our donors and says, you can't raise money from these donors because they're not producing income anymore, but there's this thing called the uh, PPP loan, so I was supposed to sit back and go, well, I guess I'll, I'll let my organization go under because I, I don't believe in, in PPP loans. I don't. I think they're terrible. But that, those are the conditions that were laid before me. I couldn't even go and apply for a loan at a bank, a conventional loan, because the PPP loan took precedence over other uh, forms of financing. That's unfortunate, but that's... That's the way it is. So, yeah, I take advantage of that because I know that my opponents are going to take advantage of that. There are plenty of organizations that work here in this building that got PPP loans also. So what the left tries to do is they say, oh, look at you. You took that money. They would rather I don't take the money so I'm unable to compete against them. I don't like it. It sucks. But it's the, the, those are the cards that were dealt. You talk about holding legislators accountable, though, and saying, well, they say one thing and they do another. Why isn't it okay for them, but why was it okay for you? Yeah, I mean, it would be one thing if we came to the, to the, to the legislature or we went to Washington, D.C., and we lobbied for PPP loans. We didn't. But the moment those things passed, that's, those are the conditions we, we find ourselves in. It's the same thing where I've got conservative friends who hate government and intervention in the marketplace, but their kids are on Medicaid. I don't tell them, no, don't get Medicaid because you don't believe in it. These are the cards that you've been dealt. If your kids qualify for Medicaid, go get Medicaid. Now, I'll fight tooth and nail to get rid of Medicaid because I think Medicaid is a terrible program. But in the meantime, the fact that it exists, you should go use that. Policymakers are in a different position, though. Policymakers have a, a choice. They can choose to not participate in that system. They have the ability to say no. They have the ability to say, we're not going to approve corporate welfare. Or we're not going to approve um, rent-seeking programs. Uh, but the moment they do, I don't fault any business for applying for a, 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 a tax credit or a tax deduction or um, a loan. I got an FHA loan. Do I, when I was a homeowner, did I think that the Federal Housing Administration and FHA loans were terrible programs? You're darn right I did. But... If I didn't go and get an FHA loan, I couldn't own a house. So I play the game. So that's a part of public record, too. If you go look up in the county courthouse in Canyon County, you'll see loan documents that indicated I used an FHA loan, which I, could, which I didn't have to, but those are the cards were dealt. One of the most well-known aspects of the Idaho Freedom Foundation is your Freedom Index. Can you explain what that is? So the Freedom Index takes a look at every single bill that goes to the legislature to see if it interacts with the marketplace in very specific ways. Uh, does it create a new program? Does it create a new uh, bureaucracy? Um, does it raise taxes or fees? Uh, does it interfere with the, the private market, the free market, and its ability to operate? Does it create some new crime uh, that is not based on, on uh, vi uh, committing an act of violence against another person? And on and on and on. And we look at every single bill the exact same way. Um, so as you look at that legislation, you can see in real time whether a legislator is voting for more government or less government. Uh, the scores update every early in the morning, and so legislators can see what their impact is on the free market, on, on, on conservative principles, 
and their constituents can see the same thing. Because we expect that legislators are going to vote for bills. Um, they may vote at some point or another to raise a fee or, or create some new program here or there. Um, but it's like watching grass grow. They do it so incrementally, one bill at a time, they don't even realize their cumulative effect. So the Freedom Index was designed to shine a light on that. So you can see if a legislator is growing government or shrinking government. We don't give scores to legislators. They score themselves by their votes. And these scores are often very publicized on social media. Do you feel at all that those scores, in a sense, pressure lawmakers to vote a certain way because you want a high score in order to garner votes? No, I think that legislators use the data. They look at our analysis of legislation and they ask a lot of questions. They, they, you know, they see a bill that has a negative rating or a positive rating. Oftentimes, legislators will call us and ask us to explain why that is. And we point them to the analysis and we run through the bill step by step, line by line, and explain how we get their con the, the conclusion. But we've never, I hear a lot on social media that we bully legislators. I've never once picked up the phone and called a legislator and said, you better vote this way on this bill. Um, and there are very uh, pronounced examples of legislation that I wish had failed that passed, even though we, we you know, got a low Freedom Index score. Um, but so th there's, no, there's no pressure. We're just applying a different metric than the one that you usually get from the lobbyists. The lobbyists show up here and they give you a billion reasons why a, law should be, why a bill should become law. And we just provide a different perspective, one that's the perspective of freedom and liberty. There are a few lawmakers who do have a, a perfect score 100 on your index. Do you consider a perfect score on your index as an, an endorsement from the Idaho Freedom Foundation? No, we can't endorse people, so we don't. Um, people just vote the way that they believe that they should vote. And uh, some people feel that you know, bills that limit government um, are appropriate to vote for and bills that, that expand government should be voted against and they're practically religious about it and God bless them because um, that takes a lot to stand up against the special interest groups who want their legislation passed, who want to grow government, who want to extract some special benefit out of the legislature or raise a tax or raise a fee and folks that vote against those things they're under a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure, way more pressure than I, than I extract on people um, so they, they're, they're voting their conscience. These are people who they demonstrate through their votes that they truly believe in limited government. Traditionally, the base of republicanism or conservatism tends to be people who care about you know, character, family values, and those are things that you can't really quantify to a degree. Do you think the lack of that being a metric in the Freedom Index is maybe a, sh a shortcoming of it? It, it's baked into the metrics. I mean, when, when you expand government, what are you taking away from? You're taking away from families. So, for example, if I create a program to feed the hungry, and that sounds wonderful. Everybody, well, I, I hate hunger. Hunger is a terrible thing. I certainly don't want kids to starve. Who are you taking away from to create that program? Well, first of all, you're taking money from people who earned it, and you're putting it into the government. But second of all, you're taking away from those charities that exist in communities. You're taking away from families who might help people. You're taking away from food banks. You're taking away from churches. All these different organizations that otherwise would be providing those services in order to grow government. And I see that over and over again. Ultimately, when government grows, something else is shrinking. It's the family, it's the community organizations, it's the churches, it's the charities. They're being impacted, they're being hurt by government growth. So it's not, the, the, that detail is baked into every aspect of the Freedom Index, every bit of it. There are some politicians who have close ties to your organization, one of them being Janice McGeehan, who's of course running for governor. When she had her periods while uh, Governor Little was away, and she implemented executive orders. That's something that traditionally, again, not necessarily a conservative principle. Is that something you agree with doing or no? 
the issuing of an executive order. People conflate executive orders at a, at a federal level with executive orders at the state level. They're not quite the same thing. There are certain powers that an executive in the state of Idaho as the governor has the ability to do. Their job is to run the state agencies within the realm of what the state statutes provide for. And forever, for, since, since statehood, since 1890, when the governor left the state, the uh, lieutenant governor became the governor. Not even acting governor, the actual governor. It's always been that way. And the only thing that Janice did was she said, look, if you're going to be a state, if you're a state agency, you can't have a COVID passport. That's all. You can't, you can't tell people in order to walk into the Department of Agriculture, you have to demonstrate that you've had a, a vaccination or a negative COVID test. That's all she did. Her job is to run the state agencies. And part of running the state agencies is to put the conditions upon how people interact with those agencies. She did nothing wrong. And for, for, for decades, no one would question that until, you know, a, a couple of months ago when suddenly we had this um, reinterpretation of what the state constitution says. There were some who criticized Idaho Freedom Foundation's consistent support for Representative Priscilla Giddings throughout the course of her ethics hearing. Uh, can you explain why you guys remain supportive of her? I mean, I don't know that we did anything particularly uh, uh, su supportive. Uh, I, I, all, all we did was, was note the fact that she has a right to free speech. Um, she's a great legislator, by the way. She's always had an outstanding voting record. But what she did was she linked to an article where the name of the person who was accusing a representative of an act was mentioned. And that was enough for an ethics violation. I've been in this building for 27 legislative sessions, and I have never seen the ethics system, the ethics process, be used against a legislator like that. I have seen some really crappy things go in the mail before email and in email nowadays and on social media, things that are certainly a lot worse than what Priscilla did. She linked to an article that named the person who made an accusation before there were even charges filed. And the person in, in that case was claiming that she wasn't even going to file charges. That's what they were getting after her for. And I would just tell you one other thing about Priscilla and, and, and this allegation. Uh, the notion of not naming a victim of a crime is a fairly recent phenomenon. And this was based on, I was in the media, I worked in newspapers and, and in radio and television in the late 80s and early 90s. And at that time, you named the, the victim of a crime. But the uh, lobbying groups for victims' rights causes went to the media and said, we think that you shouldn't name uh, a victim of a sexual crime in any of your reporting. And at that time, it was extremely controversial. The reason it was extremely controversial is because reporters understood that that meant that people could accuse somebody of a sexually based crime and not have their name put out there, that they couldn't do something that is protected in our state and U.S. Constitution, which is the right to confront your accuser. That's what we're facing right now. And there have been a multitude of instances where a person has been wrongly accused of something by an anonymous um, so-called victim. Now, I don't know if that was the case here. All I'm saying is that the media has set the standard for what legislators are supposed to put in their newsletters. Well, that's just ridiculous. In recent years, the media has decided that, or have decided, the media have decided that if you decide to identify as a different gender than the one you were born as, then you should be, that, that's the, the pronoun that should be used with your, with your uh, description, with your, with your name. Uh, so what happens 20 years from now when a legislator links to an article that misgenders somebody? Is that an ethics violation too? The point is, is that Priscilla didn't do anything wrong. 
but the ethics process was used against her because she has a conservative voting record and because the Speaker of the House is running against her. That's just wrong. That is a misuse of power and one that I've never seen before. You talk, though, about legislators wanting to hold them accountable, wanting them to make sure they are doing exactly what they're saying they're going to do. And I'd imagine that requires some element of being thorough when you're looking through legislation, when you're making every move that you make. Do you think that maybe she should have been more thorough so that you don't fall into this kind of a trap of making a mistake when you're linking to things as a public figure? Well, I mean, how many times do you tweet something or link to an article on social media and what do they say, TLDR, too long, didn't read? People do that. You know, so you're in a hurry, you, you link to an article, was it right, was it wrong? I don't know. But in America, we have this thing called free speech. And free speech comes with consequences, which means that people were, are going to link to articles and you don't like those articles. But should a, a legislator be reprimanded for that, expelled from office for that, censored for that? I don't think so. That is a very slippery slope. We will one day regret that. Remember what I said, the last policy is the blueprint for the next policy. So 10 years from now, 20 years from now, maybe even one year from now, I don't know, when a legislator links to an article where a person has been misgendered, that's going to be a crime, that's going to be an ethics complaint, and somebody's going to have an investigation over that. It's unfortunate. In America, we have a right to free speech, and legislators should be free to speak to their constituents how they want to. Let them decide if they want to keep Priscilla Giddings as a representative or not. Don't, don't try to kick them out of office because it suits your political agenda. You spoke a bit about the interesting relationship these days between Speaker Scott Bedke and Representative Giddings as they are running against each other for lieutenant governor. Recently, Luke Malik dropped out of the race and endorsed Speaker Bedke at what is still a fairly early stage of this upcoming election. Do you think that that group of conservatives who are not the same group that are generally high scoring on your index, do you think that they're scared of her and scared of maybe the support that she has? I, I don't know about that. I, I, first of all, I, I'll tell you what I do know. I wouldn't call, no one would describe Luke Malik or Scott Bedke as conservatives. No one ever. Um, their records don't, don't portray that. They, they score very badly on the Freedom Index. They support limited government only when it's convenient to them. They don't support limited government all the time, and their records speak clearly. I mean, they're, I could, they're count uh, the many times that Scott Bedke voted to regulate businesses, voted to expand government, voted for more regulations, voted for more higher taxes, um, and, and Luke Malik also. They are not conservatives. What they're afraid of, now listen, by the way, I like Scott, nice guy. I've known him for many, many years, two decades. If I were fighting a water rights issue, I'd want Scott Bedke. But he's not interested in limited government, never has been. And the reason why they're afraid of people like Priscilla Giddings is because she actually does support limited government. And the contrast is pretty obvious. Here you have somebody who, voted, who votes consistently to limit government, and over here you have somebody who votes all the time for big government. Now, the question for Idaho voters is, what do you want? Do you want somebody who consistently votes for limited government, or do you want somebody who votes for big government when, it, when it's convenient? So that, that's a choice, that's a legitimate choice that voters get to decide. Uh, they might feel that government serves a purpose and they'll go with Scott Bedke. But that's the choice. That's the decision. And both Luke and Scott offer that same value proposition, which is why Luke got out of the race. We often hear criticisms from your organization about lawmakers. What do you think Idaho's lawmakers are doing well? Not much. I, I will say this. The House of Representatives is a very different body than it was 12 years ago. Very different. Blame the Freedom Foundation, blame you know, the newcomers into the body, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, but for the first time, they're asking a lot of really good questions. For example, on education issues. When the colleges and universities would show up here, I've seen for decades, you know, the university president shows up and they're asked, how's the football team doing and what research projects are you working on? Now the university presidents are being asked, 
Why are our students learning about critical race theory? Why are they being told that America is a racist nation? Why are they being told that if you're white, you're a racist? Why do you have black graduation, which seems segregationist? Why do you have gay graduation, which seems very prefer uh, uh, preferential? Um, they're at being asked very, very difficult questions. And that's kudos to the House for doing that. Um, it has changed a lot. They're asking the right questions and they're recognizing that their role is to protect liberty and keep government small. The Senate, on the other hand, is a very different body. It's like night and day. You would not be able to distinguish the Idaho Senate from Democrat liberal lawmakers in Connecticut or Illinois or any other liberal state, pick yours, Washington, Oregon, California. They look very, very similar to that. But the House is doing a great job holding agencies accountable, asking tough questions, voting down budget bills that spend too much money. So I wouldn't say, what's the legislature doing correctly? I would say the House of Representatives is doing something very different and very good, while the state Senate is doing the usual things, siding with special interests, um, worrying about re-election and not about their constituents, um, basically not doing the things they need to do to keep government small and limited, even though they claim otherwise. Well, you made the segue for me because we're moving to education now. Uh oh, education. <laughs> <laughs> um, a few months ago, I spoke with Superintendent of Public Education, Sherry Ibarra, during her conference on connecting assessment and instruction. She told me after visiting a number of schools in Idaho that I am proud to say I haven't seen it on one time in tour regarding critical race theory. She said, I've seen a lot of facts being taught. I've seen some great educators enthusiastically in front of their students talking about history, the Bill of Rights, and the Constitution. Is critical race theory being taught in Idaho schools? She's either lying or she's not looking. And I'll let you decide which is the truth. The, the simple fact of the matter is we see it everywhere. Not a week goes by where we don't hear more information, more evidence that yes, critical race theater, theory, critical gender theory are being taught. Um, it, it's, our, our teachers are being trained on how to view students as a collection of races and genders and to really focus on those things and to view white students as um, a, a, the children of oppressors and children who, um, uh, who are Hispanic or of a different race are uh, the oppressed and, to, and to, to kind of drill that into their heads. And by the way, critical race theory is known by another name, which is culturally responsive teaching, which is baked into Idaho's administrative rules when it comes to the education system. So yes, it is there. It is prevalent and we'll be releasing even more information imminently that shows that, it, that even more evidence. So often we hear when it comes to critical race theory, the examples are kind of he said, she said, this parent said this, this person said that, and some of those are being debunked, but you're saying there's actual documented proof that this is happening in Idaho schools. It's on our website. Um, there's, there'll be more information on our website even than what we have. But yeah, I find it really interesting that we keep putting the information out there. We show evidence that teachers are either being taught to teach in this way. I mean, by the way, the other thing that, that let me finish the thought, um, the, 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 we're, we're providing evidence all the time that it's happening and what happens is, is that some government official says no it's not happening and then the media says well it's not happening because some official told us it's not happening here it is it's on our website we've showed it to people over and over and over again but the other thing is is that there's not um, it's not like a, this is the thing is that there's not a class where it's okay folks welcome to critical race theory 101 that doesn't exist it's more subtle than that it's baked into the way math is taught. It's baked into the way English is taught. It's baked into the way children are communicated with and how they're segregated from one another and this overemphasis on race and gender. That's where the social justice agenda manifests itself in really big ways. And that also manifests in the reason why uh, so many young people have joined movements like Black Lives Matters because they've been taught this stuff in their public schools, including public schools in Idaho. When it comes to critical race theory, a lot of times we hear very differing explanations of what it is. Do you think it's more so 
what is being taught, the actual subject matter in school, or is it how is it being taught? It's both. It's both. And, and look, I wish this wasn't taking place. I tell people this all the time. I don't enjoy this topic. I enjoy talking about tax policy. I enjoy talking about regulations. I enjoy talking about private property rights. You know, all these things that are the, the, the core of our work for the last dozen years. But education, the system is being used against us. It's being used to destroy our country. It's being used to tear the fabric of America apart. And so, yes, it's happening. Do I wish it wasn't happening? Do I wish it wasn't being baked into kids' curricula and into teachers' brains in terms of how they communicate with students? Yes, I do. I really wish it wasn't. But it is. It's happening. And so, therefore, we're going to take it on and we're going to get, make sure that it doesn't uh, continue to invade our public education system. Do you believe that children in school should be taught things like slavery? The Jim Crow laws, massacre of indigenous people in Idaho, or imprisonment of the Japanese in internment camps here in Idaho, should those be taught even if just from a historical perspective? Absolutely. I, I, look, here, here's, there are four things that students should be taught. Reading, writing, arithmetic, and the government history of oppression. Government oppresses people. We fled England to, to flee oppression. I'm a Jew. Uh, don't get me started on the oppression faced by Jews for millennia. Um, I'm, I'm a product of the South. Uh, when I was growing up in, in Florida and Arkansas in the 70s and 80s, Jim Crow was not in the distant rearview mirror. I understand what all those things are about, and people need to understand government's history of oppressing people and people using government in order to oppress people. What they shouldn't be taught, however, and what they are being taught is that America was built on racism, because that's not true, that all the things that America has brought forward, constitutionally protected rights, private property rights, freedom of religion, uh, capitalism, that all those things are racist. That's what we're talking about. When we talk about critical race theory being uh, pushed in the public education system, being pushed in the college and university system. What we're talking about is this redefined history of America, reimagined history of America, where America was formed on the basis of racism, which is flat out false. It's simply not true. It is a comic book version of history. And it, actually, it strives to be a comic book history, version of history. It's simply fiction. America is not a racist country. It was not built on racism. The Constitution is not racist. The uh, uh, private property rights aren't racist. The, 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 the uh, uh, capitalism isn't racist. That's the thing that we're talking about, is that America has been redefined to be something that people should be outraged about because it's always been racist, which is flat out false. Should children be taught about race in school at any age? Taught about? About race. I think there's an overemphasis on race. I mean, kids will play with, with other kids, and they don't care whether they're black, white, you know, yellow, whatever, brown. Uh, they, they don't care about color. What's happening right now is there's this overemphasis on race and gender. Kids are going home to their parents and saying things like, well, gosh, you know, I'm, I guess I'm a terrible person because... You know, my friend, you know, Johnny is, is Hispanic and, 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 and I must be the, the bad guy in our relationship, which isn't fair. And it's not fair to, the, to little kids who view themselves as being oppressed because then they become timid and weak and unable to adapt into a, a melting pot society because they view themselves as something lesser. And that's not right to them. Um, gender. There are kids who are going home to their parents and saying, I don't know, am I a boy, am I a girl? I just, I, I don't know. Little kids are going home with this. There is an overemphasis, a, a, a hyper fascination with race and gender that doesn't belong in our public school system. What do you see as being wrong for children being kind of offered a view into these varying insights, though, and being able to make decisions for, for themselves about how they feel, what they identify with? When, when you're five years old, you don't know if you're a 
uh, these are the, the, the notion that you don't know if you're a boy or a girl. If you're five years old, you're either a boy or a girl. I, having this this conversation and trying to uh, impart political ideology on a small child is just nonsense and gets away from what public schools were originally designed to do. Those schools are supposed to be teaching reading, writing, and arithmetic. That's basically it. But instead, they're being used as a microcosm for leftist ideology, for the dissemination of indoctrination. In your view of the perfect Idaho, do public schools exist? No. And how would you say that would impact students in, say, rural communities? I mean, look, obviously, I mean, yes, in a perfect world, that's not going to exist. There's, there's no utopia uh, that we're suddenly going to have. All I'm telling you right now is that our public schools are failing. Who wants to continue that? Uh, so oh, our rural schools have a school. Wonderful. What percentage of kids are graduating with the ability to read, write, and do math? In most school districts across Idaho, it's about half. Sometimes it's less than that. If you go to, um, I didn't look up the data for Twin Falls, but uh, there are school districts. Every, every school student takes a standardized college entrance exam, whether they're going to college or not. And there are schools in Idaho where one in 10 can't pass reading, writing, and math. One in 10. That's awful. And those are sometimes very rural schools. Are we supposed to applaud that the rural school exists? What if that school didn't exist? What would happen? Well, are we just not going to educate kids? Of course not. Maybe we'll come up with something better. Maybe if we give parents the option of being able to choose between their public school and some other option. It may not exist right now, but if you give them the option and you allow the money to flow in a community, maybe those communities will come up with better alternatives. We're already seeing that happen in other parts of the country when the pandemic started and people were dependent, even in rural communities, on their public school. They started learning pods. They gathered a bunch of people together, hired a local teacher, and taught the kids um, that way. So I don't think we're forced into this either-or scenario where you're, you're either going to have the lousy, failing public school or you're not. If you allow for options to open up and stop protecting the public school system from uh, competition, then you'll see better results, not only for the, the individual students, but also for teachers. Teachers will have more options. They might even be able to make more money. I think that'd be great for everybody. Over the last year especially, we've seen a lot of phrasing from a variety of organizations saying parents need to take back schools. Do you believe in that? And if so, what are they taking them back from? They're taking them back from, yes, I do. Uh, they're taking them back from the unions, from the bureaucracy, um, from lethargy, where people haven't really paid attention to what schools have been doing and what results they've been having or what they've been teaching. Um, so, I mean, you have parents that are finally asking questions, questions they should have been asking all along. You know, what are my kids learning? What are they not learning? What are they being exposed to that has nothing to do with the curricula or with what they need to, to know in order to compete in the workforce or, in, or go on to a college education? They're asking those questions. They're demanding answers. And I think that's a, a beautiful, very healthy thing. Do you have any concern if these views of what's being taught are restricted in schools, that children are going to you know, leave the home, going to college, or going into the workforce, having only been exposed to a small sense of what the world really is? The, the, I think it's, it's, it's a false argument. I mean, the schools don't exist to, be, to, to, to build uh, characters and to you know, Im, imbue students with... Um, you know, the teacher's philosophy of what's right and what's wrong in the world. It's for reading, writing, and arithmetic. It's really about it. So anything beyond that is a, a ridiculous extension. Oh, and they should learn, of course, the history of, uh, of government and how government is, is, is a terrible thing. They don't learn that. Instead, they learn, you know, how the world is a terrible place and America is a racist nation. And I don't think that they... That they are suffering because they, I graduated from school not learning that America is a racist country. We all did because it's not. It's simply just not true. 
So giving them this perspective that was basically formulated by left-wing activists is, is, is wrong. It's hurtful to them. It's not helpful. It's hurtful. I certainly didn't learn those things in school either. And I think I and many people would look to one or two teachers in their life as saying they had a huge influence on them as they grew up that extended far past the classroom. When you restrict all of the learning in the classroom to just, we're going to do math, English, history, that's it. Nothing else that goes past that is allowed. Do you remove the ability for teachers to be that role model for some of these students in ways that are far reaching, far past just learning those subjects? My favorite teacher in, in my career, academic career, was uh, my algebra teacher. Um, Houston Case was his name. I'll never forget him. And he really pushed me hard uh, to understand algebra, which I thought was just a very, very difficult course for me. I just didn't, wasn't getting it. And I was giving up on it. Um, but he, he pushed me. Other teachers along the way, a, a, a fellow who we had on our on our um, uh, high school campus, a radio station. And a guy named Pat Sullins uh, taught me how to uh, be a, um, uh, a radio board operator and then an announcer and then a, a basketball color uh, commentator and then a play-by-play -play announcer. And so there are folks who, who taught me a, a lot of wonderful things. Um, so there, there are, there's value in uh, the current education system um, but the value has been depleted by all these other things, this, this exposure to students to activism, and they're trying to make, uh, to mold students' minds into being uh, young liberal activists. That's a problem, and that's something that doesn't, doesn't bode well for this next generation of Idahoans or Americans. You spoke a bit earlier about the public university system. I know Idaho Freedom Foundation has many times spoken about wanting to remove funding that they feel goes towards diversity and social justice programming. Uh, back in March, I interviewed a U.S. Army veteran who graduated from Boise State University, and he said that veterans affairs programs typically lie under that diversity programming, and that without those programs, he would not have been able to graduate because of the unique needs of veterans who have been deployed, and then going to university. What would you say to veterans who maybe funding for their programs is at risk as well? The programs for veterans have never been at risk. No one's ever talked about eliminating programs for veterans. It's simply not true. What we're talking about is a college and university system that gives favoritism, special preferential treatment to people based on race, sexual orientation, or gender. Diversity, equity, and inclusion is about that. It's about taking people and breaking them down into the sum total of the color of their skin, um, their sexual orientation, or uh, um, their gender. And that's just wrong. You shouldn't look at somebody and say, we're going to treat you differently because you're brown or because you're white, or we're going to treat you as oppressed because you're a certain color or a certain gender. That's what the diversity, equity, and inclusion program is all about. It has nothing to do with veterans. No one has ever, ever talked about eliminating veterans programs. We've never talked about eliminating programs uh, based on uh, you know, first-time college students. If somebody's going to come along and say, well, I'm a first-time college student, and you're targeting me. No, we're not. We're talking about not treating people, not judging people based on the color of their skin, their sexual orientation, or their gender. That's all we're talking about here. We've now come to a place where we are delighting in this notion of a segregist uh, um, institution run by the government, by the way. Again, I, I grew up in the South. If somebody said to me, black lunch counters, I thought that was horrible. That, that was definitely racist, right? And now we say black graduation. Well, that's not racist. Of course it is. Of course it is. You're taking people and you're, you're isolating them. You're otherizing them as some people say, and that's just wrong. The fact is, is that the world is a very complex place with a lot of people with all different skin colors and religious beliefs. And uh, uh, that, that's, just, that, that's the reality that we're pushing, that, that people are going to be exposed to when they're pushed out into 
uh, the world of work. And when you deny them and you protect them from that or you tell them that they're part of an oppressed class because of their skin color or because of their race or their religion or their sexual um, organs, that's where diversity, equity, and inclusion really causes a hardship to folks. It's not inclusive, it's exclusionary, and it's wrong. If, say theoretically though, there was a school that had a white graduation, a black graduation, an LGBTQ graduation, as long as you're graduating, why do you care? Because it's wrong. Because again, you're, you're compartmentalizing people based on race, based on sexual orientation. You're saying that's the most important attribute that you're supposed to look at? What are, what are the things I need to know about you? I need to know the color of your skin, and I need to know your sexual orientation, and I need to know your religion? I mean, that, that's silly. Um, people are more than just their, their race. They're more than just their gender. They're more than just their sexual orientation. And that's all, that, that is how you fight racism. We're going backwards. Now we're compartmentalizing. You're this color, you're that color, you're this race, you're this gender. And, and we're doing it under the auspices of government. You know, if you, if you want to do that in the private sector, I mean, knock yourself out. But the government is taking it upon itself to put people in little categories, in boxes. And that's just flat out wrong. So do you not believe that people from groups that have historically been pushed down or, or minimized, you know, whether that is black people, whether that is members of the LGBTQ community, do you not believe that they deserve a safe space on campus? You're asking the wrong question. Look, I'm a Jew. You know, if, if there's any group of people who have been oppressed for millennia, it's the Jews. Where's the Jew graduation? Why isn't there one? Well, because they don't have a, a lobbying force on campus to give them special um, privileges. But Jews or, and blacks and Hispanic people and gay people, they thrive when you don't treat them like some kind of a novelty or some kind of oppressed class. When you treat them as if they're oppressed, they're always going to feel oppressed. They're always going to feel like they're on the verge of being attacked in some way. So it's, and and never, you're never going to be able to create enough groups, and enough graduations. Where's the short people graduation? Don't short people have a really difficult time? Tall people, very tall people. I've seen tall people get on the airplane. Why isn't the airplane taller for them? I don't know. Maybe because they can't structurally build a plane that's taller for them. But the, the, the point is, is that there's always some attribute that somebody can point to and say, look at me, I'm oppressed. I'm, 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 I'm a Jew. I'm, I'm gay. I'm tall. I'm short. I'm fat. I'm skinny. Whatever. You can't make different categories for everybody. What you do is you give everybody the opportunity to thrive without calling special attention to some attribute that they have. It's just wrong to do that otherwise. What is the difference to you between saying we are naming all these groups as oppressed groups versus celebrating individualism? You can celebrate individualism. That's, that's what I'm, exactly what I'm talking about. We are celebrating individual. That's not what we're doing here. What we're doing is we're taking groups out. We're saying you're oppressed, so we're going to have a special celebration for these people that we consider to be oppressed. But if you're not part of a, of a big enough group of oppressed people, um, then you don't, get a, you don't get that special treatment. All this is is manipulation. This is a long-time strategy by the left to divide people. And they do it by taking the, the next group du jour and saying, you guys are oppressed. And that's just, that's just wrong. But if you let people thrive on their own without pointing out their special attributes, their, their, their different attributes, then they thrive. They do much better, way better than what we have right now, where you're taking individuals and you're saying, you're just, you're just somebody who's always going to, you're always going to be oppressed because of the color of your skin or your sexual orientation, or the religion that you happen to practice. That's what we're doing to people on campus right now, and it's not pretty. What then happens with these folks that we treat as being oppressed all the time is they go out in the world and they realize that you know, KMVT doesn't have a, a, um, a special um, class, a special um, diversity, equity, and inclusion office. There's no 
office that, that goes and protects you because you happen to be gay or because you happen to be black or because you happen to be Jewish. But you still have to operate in that world, right? And you still want to hire people who are the best at their jobs, right? So you're not going to give them special, special compensation or special dispensation because of how they happen to look. And that makes them stronger. We'll move on to COVID-19. Um, the Idaho Freedom Foundation published an op-ed in January from medical advisor John Livingston. It said, quote, the fact is, and this is not just John Livingston's opinion, we are not in a pandemic. Do you think at any point in the past two years a global pandemic has existed? No. Why? Because simply put, uh, there have been other actual pandemics that have impacted more people as a percentage, have had a higher morbidity, um, has had far more economic consequences than this one. Uh, this is a virus that, frankly, was used for political purposes. Um, it had that it had the, the successful effect in that regard that was able to um, impact the presidential election in 2020. Um, but beyond that, it has been blown out of proportion. It is a virus. It has killed people. It has made people sick, but it is not what you would call a pandemic. So looking to the mitigation strategies, things like masking, things like vaccinations, would you say you believe in personal choice in those matters? Absolutely. I mean, if a mask is such a wonderful thing, if a vaccine is such a wonderful thing, then let people choose whether that is the solution that works for them. Um, but there's plenty of evidence that suggests that the masks are merely a, uh, um, a communications contrivance. It's designed as a crisis communication tool intended to make people feel as if they're accomplishing something by wearing a mask when in fact they're really not. And the existence proof is when you, when you hear people like Dr. Fauci going around and saying, well, maybe you should wear two masks or three masks, or maybe new goggles would, would help you. It is a communications tool to make people think as if they're accomplishing something, and it's really not. There have been different times that people have done studies or shown videos of a similar idea to what you're describing for security at an airport, that they go through security at the airport, and yet there are still ways people could somehow hide a weapon or something and make it through that security line, yet we all comply with that. What's the difference? Again, the, the, the last policy is the, is the blueprint for the next policy. Well, we make you go through security. Uh, the, the fact is that, that TSA is one of the worst run government operations on the planet. Um, it has allowed for knives and guns and plenty of other dangerous things to get through security and onto planes so it doesn't work as well as people think it does. It's basically security theater. It makes people feel good. The same with masks. Masks make some people feel good. It makes them feel as if they're doing something when really they're not. Do you believe people should consult with their doctors about coronavirus? Sure. Consult with your doctors. I consulted with my doctor. I said to my doctor, should I get a vaccine? And she said, well, you're a healthy 49-year-old man. What do you need a vaccine for? And I said, that's kind of what I was thinking. So I have not gotten a vaccine. And I think I've been proven right not to do that based on the fact that you know, even vaccinated people are still getting sick and vaccinated people are being told they still should go and wear masks. And they should still stay six feet apart and they probably shouldn't hang out at parties. I mean, I don't understand what the vaccine really is doing. So, yeah, consult with your doctor, but also do your own research, do your own due diligence, because there are plenty of people who are going to tell you to go get a vaccine because that's what the industry wants you to believe and what wants their profession to believe when it may not exactly be the most efficacious thing. Do you think over the course of the past two years, we, with regards to coronavirus and strategies for either mitigating it or not being up for debate, do you think that we have lost empathy for people who are elderly or people who are immunocompromised or people who are disabled by saying, oh, well, that person died. They were old, though. That's okay. I've never heard that. I've never heard that. Um, the fact is that old people die, young people die. Um, those are tragic things that happen. Life is tragic. Um, I, I, I think what, what you're seeing, though, is those examples being used and people being beat about the head and shoulders. I had somebody on Twitter said the other day that I was responsible, that I 
was responsible for the death of a child. And that's just not right. You know, the fact is, meanwhile, at the same time, you have people that are, are healthy, young and old, who are getting the vaccine and then keeling over of a heart attack or having some other problem that's lifetime and debilitating. We've seen plenty of evidence that that's true. And yet no one is going around saying, gosh, isn't it a shame that that perfectly healthy person who got the vaccine suddenly dropped dead of a heart attack? Why, why not? Because it doesn't fit the media narrative. We obviously recently have heard word about a new variant uh, coming out of South Africa. Do you believe the variants are real? I mean, I, I'm not a scientist, so I don't know if they're real or not. But what I do know is that it seems like every time people start uprising and questioning the, the COVID narrative, a new variant comes out to scare everybody. And it's funny how after just a few days, the doctors who have studied this new variant to the degree that it's been studied are saying that a, no one has died, and B, the symptoms are very mild. So maybe it exists, maybe it doesn't exist, but the, the point is, is that it doesn't sound as scary as people are making it out to be. For you, when you see things like mass mandates and travel bans and the like being kind of brought up in other states, do you, did you ever have concern of that actually happening here in Idaho to the degree that you'd see in know what you would term more liberal state well, definitely we had mask mandates here in Boise we've seen mask mandates in uh, Moscow and in in, um, in uh, Ketchum Sun Valley um, I mean there are places where mask mandates have been put in and enforced um, we've seen people you know who've had the cops called on them for not wearing masks we've seen people arrested for not wearing masks these things have happened in Idaho uh, we've seen stay-home orders that people have been uh, charged with violating misdemeanor crimes for holding a, a yard sale in Idaho. So we're not immune to those things because we're Idaho. It's happening here, too. Sometimes you'll hear people say, you know, if somebody comes and moves somewhere from another country, for example, and they'll say, well, if you don't like what's happening here, then how about you go live somewhere else? I mean, what's the difference with that if there's a mass mandate in place? I don't really understand the question. So, for example, sometimes we see people move somewhere from another country, and they'll say, well, I don't like this, I don't like that. And residents will say, well, if you don't like it here, go move somewhere else. If somebody were to live somewhere where there was a mass mandate that they didn't agree with, what's wrong with going and just moving somewhere well, else? Certainly people can go do that, but, you know, uh, the same thing can be said about high property taxes. Well, if you don't like the property taxes, go move somewhere else. If you don't like the income tax, go move somewhere else. Um, that is certainly an option that's open to people, and people are taking advantage of that. But as long as I have this thing called Idaho Freedom Foundation, I'm going to fight any mandate that affects any kind of Idahoan um, in the hopes that maybe you know we can preserve a little bastion of liberty right here in our state, this laboratory of liberty. If Idaho, which is run by Republicans, the Republican-controlled legislature is 80-something 80, 80 percent Republican, if a state like Idaho can't promote and protect individual liberty, what state can? And so that's the reason why you fight for this. Because if you can't do it in Idaho, I get Washington State's messed up. Oregon's messed up. California, horrible. Um, Washington, D.C., wouldn't want to live there. Pennsylvania, not too great. Illinois, all these states that no one wants to live in because of the way in which they treat their citizens. Well, what if Idaho's like that? There are no magic beans here in our state that prevents Idaho from becoming a, a liberal bastion as well. There was a time when California was a Republican-controlled state. Uh, so was Colorado, Oregon, Washington. Other states have been here before. So if I can't keep Idaho from becoming a haven for socialism, and I think it's already on, on route to being there, then where else do you get to go? That's why we fight this fight. That's why we do it here in the state, because it's not as good as it could be. People's humanity is being stripped from them, little by little, with government telling them that you can't choose to make this decision, can't make the decision on your own about masks, about vaccines, about the papers that you carry with you, about the job that you have, about the property that you own, about the taxes that come out of your pocket. So yeah, you could move somewhere, but you're running out of places because Idaho should be 
a beacon for freedom and liberty. It should be a laboratory for liberty, and it's not. Mr. Hoffman, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Glad to do it. Thank you for coming all the way to Boise.